Good morning, class, and welcome to your first virtual lab. I was thinking long and hard about, you know, where to take you for this first adventure. And uh, I thought, you know, what better place than my own backyard? Um, anyway, I promised to do better next week. But since things were on short order this week and I'm trying to figure out how to work like a phone and a computer and all that stuff, we're just going to start out here in my backyard um, somewhere in Kershaw County. We may have people walking by. If we do and we feel threatened, we'll throw that naturalist gang sign up like that and they'll probably keep on moving, just kind of show them what's up. Uh, may or may not have some of my family members walking around out here, some cars going by, but we'll make the best of it. This is nature after all. So we're going to be taking a look at a few different uh, plants and animals today that we've had around here. We're going to start out in the shade garden. So some of these plants that are featured underneath uh, my feet or uh, shoulders at this time are shade tolerant plants that I grow and they're from uh, native landscapes. So these are plants that you would find if we were out in the woods and they'd be blooming today. Okay, so here we are with our first species and this is one that's called May apple. Um, and this species grows in the understory or actually along the forest floor of our native woodlands and uh, it creates a nice big ground cover of little umbrellas. I think they're like little fairy umbrellas and there's a whole fairy village underneath these things that we can visit and, uh, and reminisce about what it used to be like when we were children. Um, called May apple because it does have an apple-like fruit that forms, especially on, oh, there's one of my neighbors, gang sign. Okay, he's moving on. Um, it does have a flower and a fruit, especially underneath those plants, which have two leaves. So if you're gonna make a fruit, you need lots of food. You need lots of energy and food, and so you, you make two leaves in that case. The individual plants that just have one leaf, those are not gonna make flowers this year for whatever reason. They may be younger or maybe in less nutritious soil, but when they become mature and they wanna reproduce, you make two leaves for that purpose. Um, this is a poisonous plant. We don't wanna interact with this plant, but um, one animal that does interact with this often this time of year, and you can see how the little flowers are hanging underneath the fruit, the um, leaves just like that, pointing downward. This is in the perfect position for queen bumblebees to bump into these things. The queen bumblebees are out this time of year and they are looking for new places to, to live and to set up a new colony. And they need a little bit of sustenance while they're out and about so they can pull some of what they need out of those blooming May apple flowers, which are very dependent on the emergence of these queen bumblebees. Okay, how about this uh, beautiful little flower here? This is columbine in full bloom. And this, it's hard to tell from the caption or the picture, but it's coming up about three feet over a nice little cluster of beautiful leaves. They kind of look like clover leaves, but these are, um, these are important for the arrival of the ruby-throated hummingbirds. So if you look at the um, flowers there, see if I can go in a little bit, uh, they have a long neck on them, and the nectar is in the tip top, the little bulb there at the top of this flower. And the ruby-throated ruby hummingbird is especially uh, well adapted to put its beak all the way in the back of there and get the nectar, and in doing so, a little bit of pollen brushes upon its head, and it moves to the other flower, and there you have fertilization take place and the columbine can make its fruit and its seed. Um, red is a color that is especially noticed by birds. Uh, a lot of our insect species are more accustomed to purples, um, blues, uh, yellows, but when you see the color red, you can often expect that it is a flower that's pollinated by birds. And in the east, we have the ruby-throated hummingbird as one of the more important pollinators. And it should be back in this neck of the woods today, if not someday very soon. Okay, so here's another lovely little forest uh, delight. This is Trillium, so-called because of the parts of the leaves and the flowers are all in threes. So tri, as in three, Trillium, and the other name is Sweet Betsy. That's kind of my favorite name for it. These guys you find 
in fairly rich soils like floodplains, for example, or hillsides that have some nice uh, minerals leaching out of some of the nutritious um, rocks on the side. And so um, this is one of many different uh, trillium species that we have in our state. And um, these guys are interesting. Um, so you have the flower there on the top, the red, the reddish color, and um, of course that's going to develop into a fruit. And this and many other of these small ground layer species that bloom this time of year are famous for having a neat little seed that also has a little package of sugar attached to it. So um, there's things upon the forest floor that are interested in that, particularly ants. Ants will come along and grab that little sugar packet with the seed attached. They'll march back to their ant colony. They're only interested in the sugar packet, so they discard the seed. And um, the seed is discarded in their refuse pile, which is often much like a compost bin. It's, um, it's, it's nutrient dense. Um, it's usually under the ground. Um, and so the ant does really three different things for this trillium. Number one, it disperses the seed because it takes it to a new place. Number two, it plants the seed because it deposits it in its refuse pile. And number three, it fertilizes it because the refuse pile has to, uh, happens to be uh, nutrient dense. And so um, other studies have also shown that the seeds are cleaned by the ants. And so uh, seeds that are dispersed by ants fertilize uh, or germinate at a much greater rate than those that are not dispersed by ants. And this is thought to be because of the, some of the antimicrobial properties that ants tend to exude upon the materials that they collect. So here's another nice treat. Uh, this is witch alder in bloom. And uh, the scientific name for this guy is, is after a pretty famous South Carolina botanist who was a contemporary of Linnaeus, who uh, named this species after um, Alexander Garden from Charleston. And so this is a species that is a shrub, so it's actually coming up to about your waist. And uh, it's common throughout the state. I see it commonly in the sand hills in some of the herbaceous seepages around Carolina Sand Hills Wildlife Refuge, for example, and uh, places such as that. Um, these beautiful white flowers, they, they come out, and I'm seeing a little bit of activity around them, um, some of it from flies. So flies are pollinators too, not just bees and butterflies. Okay, keep that in mind. Flies matter and um, they're important pollinators for this and, and the, this and other species. When um, the blooms come out, they are uh, before the leaves. The leaves will come out a little bit later. They'll have beautiful, very symmetric uh, parallel veins with scalloped leaf edges um, that are quite nice to look at. So the shrub has pretty foliage as well as these beautiful white bursting blooms in the spring of the year. Which alder? Okay, so this species is called Eastern Red Bud, and this is a tree. So this is a tree, it's an understory tree that we use to cast shade upon the shade garden. Um, this is a very common tree, we see it in just about every type of habitat throughout South Carolina, and it's a great one to bring into your home because, you know, in the spring it has uh, this nice adornment of beautiful, uh, kind of purpley more than red blooms upon it that are full of bees, honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, blueberry bees. The whole um, overstory of these trees will be buzzing with pollinators this time of year. So you have those lovely flowers. This is in the bean family and so after those flowers are done you can see a nice little pod hanging down from these branches. That's one way to easily recognize it because that's kind of strange. We don't think about a lot of trees being um, beans, but they are. And then also you have eventually these nice expanded heart shaped, there we go, leaves that are formed. And um, there's only a few heart shaped leaf trees that are hanging out in South Carolina, maybe two or three. And um, this is probably the most common. So that kind of narrows it down to, for you as well. These will get several times as big. They'll be almost as big as my hand and thereby cast a good bit of shade onto the garden uh, later on in the summer when we need it. Now, we like to sometimes harvest the little flowers of these because they have a sweet little taste. 
that goes well on top of a salad this time of year. All right, so we got a little uh, mushroom coming up called a stinkhorn fungus, and we got some volunteers here try to tell us why it has the name it has. What do you think, Alex? Smell. Yeah? You don't like that? No. Uh, why do you think it smells so bad? Uh, to make plants not, stuff not eat it. Um, close, but sort of the opposite. Oh, it's because it wants to spread. Yeah, spread some spores so the little flies come and get all intermingled in there and carry spores from one place to another. But it's decomposing the mulch that's in our garden. I wonder if this thing's... Uh, I don't think it wants to eat that. Uh, I, I was just seeing if it smelled oh. like it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back in the garden and I've just walked up on one of the rarest species in the entire state of South Carolina. This is, a, this is called a white bunny. I'll give you a minute to write that down. White bunny. Okay, These are especially uncommon. Um, and the thing is, they love purple phlox. They like to get in and eat the lower leaves of the purple phlox. They don't touch the flowers, which is why we let this species exist in here without any kind of negative interactions. But they just like the lower leaves. And um, it's, it's strange. They depend on, they think that they're as camouflaged as a re regular eastern cottontail. You know, if you're walking through the woods, typically you see an eastern cottontail. Um, it has seen you first, and its first line of defense is often just camouflage. It'll hope that you walk on by, uh, and if you don't, then it'll bound off, and it has a little white cottony tail to sort of distract the predator, so, you know, the important parts of the body are, are safe and sound, but um, the white, the rare white bunny thinks that it also has camouflage, and that's why this thing is just sitting here. It doesn't even know that I'm looking at it. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of just hoping that I don't really see it. Maybe I'm just chilling out, observing the purple flocks and waiting on some pretty little butterflies to come by. But anyway, I just wanted to try to work this into the video because this is a really special treat. You're unlikely to ever see this again for the rest of your life. So here's one that everybody should know. Um, this is a South Carolina state symbol. This is our state flower. It's called the Carolina Jessamine. And um, it's all along the roadsides this time of year. If you happen to drive poorly like I do and be looking toward the side of the road toward the plants instead of um, keeping it between the lines, you sometimes notice this blooming along the fence rows and other places. one of the first things to, to come out into bloom. And uh, it is a vine. It has uh, opposite leaves that are evergreen. So these leaves are oriented opposite of one another upon the stem. That's why we call them opposite leaves. Um, flowers are nice and beautiful and yellow, and sometimes people get this confused with honeysuckle, but that's a bad mistake to make because honeysuckle is an edible plant that won't cause you any difficulty in your existence. But if you eat this plant, you're quite likely to die. So we don't want to get those two things confused. Honeysuckle has a much uh, broader leaf. It's not quite as glabrous and shiny. It typically has some serrations upon the edges. Um, and the flowers are white at least to begin with and then they fade into a yellow color and much skinnier, more narrow than the Carolina jessamine flowers. Um, despite its poisonous nature, this is a favored um, nectar food, especially of queen bees that are out this time of year. So important nectar source for them. They seem to be able to metabolize it without too much difficulty. Um, easy plant to grow, easy one to have in your um, landscape at home. It will in fact become a weed and sort of take over so you have to kind of manage it but it's well worth the effort I think because you get a bright beautiful yellow color in the spring. Okay so here is dogwood. This is a dogwood tree um, and we're looking at the flower at the moment believe it or not. Um, this is uh, the flower there in the middle actually the green things are flower buds. They're about to open. The white bracts to the outside are, are modified leaves. They do serve to sort of attract the insects to the flower, many of which are beetles, in fact. So uh, beetles pollinate too. It's not just the bees and the butterflies, guys. Equal rights for flies and beetles. They play an important part in our pollination of our native plants. This is an understory tree, so we're kind of out of the shade garden, by the way, at this point. 
This guy does good in the shade though, underneath the canopy of other uh, plants. It has um, opposite leaves. A lot, of, a lot of people say you can tell a dogwood by its bark, <laughs> but I like to use the leaves. It has opposite leaves. The leaves are oriented directly opposite of one another upon the stem. Only a few trees in South Carolina that have that. So um, you can remember this by I'll Be Dam. Um, buckeyes, dogwoods, ashes, and maples are the four trees that have opposite leaves in South Carolina. So we're looking at dogwood here. Opposite leaves, uh, they come up and they have this nice, beautiful uh, bract of leaves with flowers that are going to pop open here in a minute. So those green things are going to have, um, you know, all the parts of the flower. They're going to have pistils and stamens, and they're going to develop into those fruits the bright little red cluster of fruits that you see in the fall of the year that are delectable little treats for all the birds, especially woodpeckers that move through this forest. Dogwood's a fantastic species. It's be in everybody's yard, I think, in um, South Carolina. It's easy to grow. Uh, the great thing about some of these native plants is just stick them in the ground. They're used to these soils, poor as they may be. Um, they've grown here for many millennia, and so you don't have to give any special treatment to them. So, dogwood, fantastic tree, get you one. Okay, so we got some rain moving in, so we're gonna be moving inside here in just a moment, but hopefully you've learned a lot about some of the plants uh, and animals that you can bring to your backyard if you uh, start to plant some native plants. A lot of these can be obtained from reputable nurseries who propagate these plants, um, you know, without taking anything from the wild. Um, you can find access to these on the internet through programs and uh, organizations such as the South Carolina Wildlife Federation or Native Plant Society have a great list of ways to access um, these types of plants. They bloom great, they're easy to take care of, they bring in lots of wildlife and they're worth having in your backyard. So, have a great day.